record button. Hey, man. Let me hit this record button. And uh, to start over what you just said, You're fe- I'm doing great, feeling great. And then you said, Yes, yeah, so I'm feeling great. You know, I, I got a bit of a cold, but I'm going to be all right. You know, a lot of my clients are sick. Beautiful wife is sick. Beautiful baby is sick. Uh, but you know what? It's got my green tea, great antioxidants, awesome self care. I journaled today. I meditated today. I got my workout in. All that felt great. I still wanted to move today. Super important. You know, you want to feel, even when you're, you don't feel your best physically, you don't want to not move, which is so important. Uh, and so, anyway, so I'm feeling a lot better. I'm super excited to see you, man. Super excited to be a part of this. Well, I'm excited to be here and be yeah. on. And, uh, you know, I just want to say, like, you're doing everything by the book. You're doing it all. That's exactly what you need. And maybe, maybe we'll find something if we'll, if you allow me to play with yeah. uh, the things that I do professionally. Yeah. Maybe you'll feel better in, like, two minutes. Oh, my God. That'd be amazing. Okay. Tell me what you're feeling right now. I'm feeling um, a little physical congestion in my nose, um, a little bit in the chest. Um, body feels good. I don't feel achy at all in the joints. Um, I feel a little run down, a little tired physically. Uh, part of that is the sleep has not been ideal lately with, um, beautiful daughter teething a lot and mm. got pipes just like Mariah Carey. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> hey, they do, uh, right? it's super impressive. I'm like, Oh my God, <laughs> not your voice lessons. Uh, so I feel like it's all here. So okay. I feel like it's a lot, um, you know, it's a lot in the respiratory system right now for me personally, uh, where I said I worked out today, I felt good working out today, I felt strong working out today, uh, did strength training, a little bit of German volume training, so it was a little mm. bit of high impact here and there, but that felt good, and did a lot of walking today between clients, and felt always good to move, mm. but I found myself throughout the day, you know, reaching for those tissues, or, you know, within five minutes, or if I'm teaching, teaching clients, or other personal trainers, it was just, you know, sorry guys, I just need to, you know, blow my nose, and right. get all this out of me, so yeah, right. so unfortunately, that's kind of where I am right now, but um, well, it's understandable, your body is yeah. essentially trying to heal itself, and yeah. how it gets rid of the bad guys, so to speak, it, you know, yeah out the nose, out the mouth, out the back, you know, everything, right. out the skin, yeah. right? Yes. And we're all, everything's connected to everything in some way, a form or fashion. Yes. So we're going to play a little game if that's okay with you for a second. Yeah, man, I'm always game. All right. So I want you to imagine your body is the center of a clock. Okay. And 12 o'clock is directly in front of you. Okay. Six o'clock is directly behind you. Okay. Three, three o'clock will be to your right. And of course, nine o'clock will be to your left. Got it. With your right hand, of course, it's opposite if you're looking at me, right? It, yeah. Kind of yeah. reach back to that like five o'clock position down by your hip area. Okay. Okay. And then move your hand about, I don't know, about a foot away from your body. Okay. All right. So you're not touching your body. Your hand is, the palm of your hand's facing you, and it's kind of at like that five o'clock position. Gotcha. I want you to imagine that you're like fanning a flame, but the flame, is at your hip and you're okay. kind of fanning it. And we want it to, we want it to like get the oxygen into the fire. So you know how you blow yeah. it, the fire gets bigger. I want you to fan that flame. Okay. And then take a nice deep breath when you feel it needed. Okay. All right, very cool. Now the next step. Okay. Right. You can imagine the gorilla in the jungle pounding the chest. Yeah, yeah. I want you to do, do that. One hand, two hands, either way. Just do it a couple of times right in the middle of that chest. All right, cool. Super cool. <laughs> All right. Now, that's important. Yeah, a little practice with that one. Just yeah, right? Bit. That is actually the thymus gland is right underneath that chest bone. And that's the key right. part of our immune system. Yeah. And so what we're doing, we're stimulating that here. Okay. Now, over here, that's an energy healing technique that I just, uh, uh, I'm not going to go into it too much, though I just connected with you. I found out where your body was kind of stuck in the energetic yeah. in the energy world, and then yeah. we move it, okay? And you know what's really, this? Is, I mean, the audience is going to think this was, you know, so planned, but it's not, because I have to tell you, I did, you know, one of the cardinal sins last night, which was I'd fallen asleep on the couch around like 10.30, 11 o'clock, so a reasonable hour, um, but I woke up in my hip, my right hip. So you mentioned the hip and you mentioned mm-hmm. the right side. Hand to God. 
was truly bothering me. And, yeah. you know, I got on the phone low, I did the self-manifest release. Obviously, that certainly helps. But what you just did really made me feel better. I really could feel the lengthening. I swear to you, that was awesome. I, I, I know. It, it, it yeah. could be like, oh my goodness, this is such a planned thing. What is going on is we're all connected in some way. If we get into that really kind of interesting thinking, the philosophy of life stuff, we're all one. That's kind of a thing we've been hearing a lot lately, I feel. Oh, yeah. And so this is in part what I do with my clients. You're just like if you walk into a party, you go to someone's house or you meet somebody, you can kind of get that feel. Oh, they, yeah. Is it good to be there? Is it not good to be there? And this, yeah. I just took that to the nth degree. And it's something I've been studying for um, more than a decade now. So, oh, sure. So it is an evolving practice. However, it was just so perfect that here you are, you get, you're dealing oh, with yeah. something. And we need to help shift that energy. Yeah, yeah. That was wonderful, seriously. That's awesome. I'm glad. I'm do more of that. I, mean, I, I, you know, I have to look back at the recording, but I feel like your, your face looks clearer. You know, yeah, more, yeah. Clear, yeah. uniform color. Yeah, that was really <laughs> helpful. Uh, so I had an opportunity to read your book. Great. And I really enjoyed it. And I thought that we shared a lot of the same practices. I thought we shared uh, the same wavelength of the mind and body connection. And in my emotional practice with my clients, one of the things that really struck a chord with me is, you know, we talk about being worthy. I mean, mm -hmm. certainly all roads lead back to self-love, but we really talk about being worthy and being your biggest fan. And I thought that was very interesting that you had something about that in your book. Uh, and then I also found it very fascinating about, you were talking about in your 20s, you know, how you take in this personal journey of, okay, I'm feeling have some physical things that I shouldn't have in my 20s uh, you know there were some other you know extreme personal things that were going on with you and then you made that incredible shift in your life to want to do even more you wanted to progress and I'm just I would love to know personally how you made that shift where did you when did you decide okay all these things are happening to me you know my health is could be at a detriment here. These are real physical problems. These are physical elements, you know, mm -hmm. you know, and you talk about the weight gain and so forth. And so I'm just curious to know is you had to have that worth all you talk about in your book about making decisions, right? You know, you talk about, you know, making choices. So was that a choice that you made exactly on your own? Did you have a mentor at the time? I just would love to know that because I found that incredibly inspiring. Well, uh, you know, a little bit of my story. I was at this point that we're talking about about 26 years old. Mm -hmm. I had recently graduated from, uh, got my chiropractic degree, my doctorate, and yeah. I wasn't, I was, see, in chiropractic, it's about the brain and nervous system. Yes. Food wasn't really that critical for me. I was just eating because I enjoyed eating, and that's something I've always enjoyed to do. Yeah. In fact, it was kind of, I just kind of grew up like most people, McDonald's once a week, sure. pizza once a week, mom's sure. just trying to make food to fill you up because I'm a growing teenager eating out of house and home. Yeah. And when I was in college football, uh, playing college football, I, you know, you ate to gain weight, you know, the bigger you were, the better you were. That's, it was part of the philosophy mm -hmm. and, and you needed to pack on those pounds. And so right. I continued that eating habit. Now I had lots of, lots of physical injuries and, and more importantly, in fact, I'm, I'm having an even deeper part of my story literally going on right now in my life, but it's the, the mental emotional injuries mm. that I was unknowingly covering up through the eating. And right. so now here I am, I graduated, I've done, yeah. I, I've, I've gotten a job. I'm, I'm a real, I'm a real person in the real world now. And I'm still eating hoagies at lunch and cheesesteaks at lunch and meatball sandwiches and fast food because I don't want to cook because I'm tired. And yeah. next thing you know, I am staring at myself in the mirror, 280 pounds. And the doctor I'm working for, he starts giving me books to read. He starts, Hey, you got to come, come attend this seminar with me. Come this seminar. Cause you know, I, I, I thought I could, you know, I thought I knew it all. <laughs> However, I barely, I, you know, graduating gave me the right to be a doctor and it gave me the right to learn more. And that's what's mm -hmm. required. Yeah. So here I am sitting in the seminar about lifestyle. It was by a professional Dr. James Chestnut. He taught this program called the Certification for Chiropractic Wellness Practitioners. And basically it went into genetics, our food, how we think, and how we move. And so when I attended that how we think ver uh, a module, yeah. he's asking the audience these questions. 
And some of the questions that really started to connect with me, he goes, well, he goes, look at your parents. Think about your parents for a moment. Mm. Think about their food choices. Think about their movement choices. Think about their, their conversation choices. Mm-hmm. Now, that's going to be you in about 30 years. And I looked mm. at my parents and, you know, I love my parents. They've, they've done right by me by, in so many good ways. And they've also challenged me in some ways that I'm not happy about. However, I looked at their health and it is not where I wanted to be. In fact, mm-hmm. I was right on track to be where my dad is at 60 and I wasn't even 30 yet. And wow. it was How about really that? a smack in my face. I'm, I'm basically a living hypocrite at that point. I, I'm teaching these health classes. I'm obese. I have pretty much everything. They call now syndrome X, but the pre-diabetic, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, skin rashes, mm-hmm. uh, male, male organ challenges, um, mm-hmm. just anger issues. And these were all common. And how did I solve this? By eating. You know, run to the wall, walk, get the ice cream, order the pizza, no big oh. deal. But I stuff yeah. the emotions down. And literally, that's what we do. We eat to stuff emotions down. Sure. It's one of the ways people do it. Agreed. And Agreed. that's where, you know, that, that seminar was a big wake-up call. And I was, you know, I guess I was so horrified with myself that it was, it was either do or die at that moment. And so, and was, yeah, this was really like your life was on the line. It really was. And literally it was. Um, right. So it was, and I think this is where a lot of men get is it's the, it's the rock in the hard place. You got your lowest point in life and then you either going to keep doing it or you're going to, you're going to make a change. Right. So I chose, I chose to make a change because I had a lot of life ahead of me and I had so many things I wanted to do and accomplish. And, and that's where I, that's where I made, started to make those decisions. And with the help of the guy I worked with, that his name is Dr. John Wilkins, and the program that I was attending to get this, get this wellness certification, you know, and it's really funny because I didn't even know what wellness meant back then. I really didn't. Yeah. 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 And, and this is something, the fitness side of things is, is still, is still something I work on and it just ebbs and flows. And this is what you see in your, I know that's what you sure. see in your work every day. We've had enough conversations about oh, yeah. people that you work with and even yourself, you know, the yeah. journey of writing your book. Right. And, you know, I find that beautiful how one of the most basic, simple exercises that anyone can do can be so challenging and so life transforming, the push up. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So how do you know, tell me about you and your book. Yeah. You, you know, you, yeah. this, you know, of course we didn't find like you discovered the push up, sure. but so, you found new ways to do it. Yeah. So what happened was this was 2004. Mm-hmm. It was the first year into personal training and I had lousy push-up form. I'm here to admit it. I had lousy push-up form. And I knew how vital the push-up was. And I was at this conference. And this is a true story. So I'm with all these other personal trainers who are, you know, 0% body fat. And everybody is like, you know, the LeBron James or Michael Jordan of the room. And then there's me, who was a fine, you know, fine athlete, but not like them. And we're all, the instructor's leading the push-up. And I'm already sweating. I'm like, oh, man, this is horrible. Like, of all the exercises. But... It's amazing what life throws at you, right? I mean, if it was the squat, maybe my path would have been totally different. So what had happened next was everybody got in that push-up position. I could not find the neutral spine. Mm. My hips were too high. They were dropping. I was hiking. I was leaning. I was rotating. My scalp was rounded. Um, the form was lousy. Elbows were flared up, you know, way past 90 degrees. And it was challenging, and I was really sweating. And the instructor had come over, and she was very sweet. And there was actually two, there was a, a gentleman and this, this really nice female instructor and they were adjusting me and they're trying to find the correct spine. They just couldn't get me to do it. I just could not, I was so blocked emotionally. Mm-hmm. I could not find it for the life of me. And it was embarrassing. It was super embarrassing because it, again, it was with all these fit people. I'm supposed to be a personal trainer. So I left with a big challenge, which was I could have walked away from the push up, or I could face the push up, and I could master the form and go on to do greater things. And of course, I chose the latter. I wanted to master the push-up and do greater things. So what happened next was just pure consistency, practicing, working hard, breaking it down, going to stabilization first before I even try to do anything with strength, Mm. and then putting the emotion into it. So I thought about why was I so blocked that day? What was the emotion of why I was so blocked? Personally, it took me back to being 11 years old, being you know sort of bad at sports in the beginning of my athletic career, you know, being packed, you know, as sort of like an overweight kid, being picked last in gym class, the emotion of being in front of my peers, uh, the fear of judgment, the fear of failure. Mm-hmm. 
And I was blocked. I was blocked that day. So I made a promise to myself, Dr. Kevin, that I would not at all ever be in that position again. It was okay to be vulnerable again. In mm -hmm. fact, you want to be vulnerable because that's where your strength lies. Mm -hmm. But I would not be fearful of a physical activity. I made that a promise to myself. So as I said, lots of consistency. And then I took the emotional aspect of it of, okay, the push-up. It is a super challenging exercise for a lot of people. And I want to make it doable for a lot of people, but we're all blocked. Like you mentioned earlier, we get blocked when it comes to emotional eating. We want to eat our emotions because that makes us feel better. It makes us feel that we can control the issue. But it, as you know, it's a one-way road to what? Just self-destruction. Right. So if we reverse it, I want to make the push-up your friend. I don't want you to fear it like I did. No, I want you to embody it. I want you to be your bestest friend. I want you to you know, cozy up to it, you know, cuddle with it. And so what I started doing was I started thinking about that deep trauma, you know, could be something superficial of, uh, you know, I hate my job to, you know, if I'm speaking to the everyday person or I got into a fight with my spouse or I have a parental issue that I really want to, you know, sort of target and, and talk to my parents about. But for me, there was some real trauma as a child that I really wanted to target, that I really wanted to zero in on. And I'm in the push-up position at the very, very top, so I'm in that concentric phase. And, okay, so I'm really starting from head to tail where I have my ankle complex forward. I'm making sure my knees are fully extended, my glutes are engaged, you know, I'm really engaging my transverse autonomous, as you know. Uh, my scapa is nice and flat, not rounded. I'm really in that 45 degree angle with my elbows. I'm really feeling my palms. I'm feeling grounded on the floor with my palms. Something I coined, which is called mitten hands, where, you know, there's no cupping. You're really feeling grounded. And before I even lower myself down, I'm thinking about this trauma, this pain, anxiety, depression, whatever it is that somebody's going through. Because as you know, we all sort of struggle with that one particular story. And I'm thinking about it, but I'm not running from it. And as I lower myself down, hopefully, you know, for somebody, they can go down all the way. If they can't, that's fine. If you can move a centimeter, does it, it's fine. It doesn't matter. Exactly. But the idea of lowering myself down and feeling empowered and then pushing myself up. And I'm not trying to get rid of it. You know, we're not trying to get rid of trauma. But what I'm trying to do is befriend it. Mm. I'm trying to lower the volume of that trauma. I'm trying to make it so, you know what, you can function. You know what, you may have that trauma in the back of your mind or that problem, you know, you can't pay your bills or you're fighting with your spouse. It's not going to go away instantly, but guess what? You're going to be able to manage it better. And so this is just a small practice, a small tool of, that I have found that I was able to find the push-up. I was able to complete the push-up. I was able to find the strength and then obviously the power when performing the push-up. So I had to write a book about, I had to write a book about it. Um, I, had to just, I had a lot to say, clearly, as I do now. So that was my own personal journey with the push-up. Well, you know, you said some really key things there mm -hmm. and, you know, when essentially I like to call it bringing your pain to tea, bringing the, bringing mm -hmm. the challenge to tea. Mm -hmm. So you, you welcomed it. You allowed yeah. it to be present. And yes. you know, I look at our emotions as, as indicators. They're like, they're like warning signs. They're, mm -hmm. they're, these are, this is the right way to take. This is something that's not right. And so your body's speaking to you essentially, and you're welcoming that message in. Yes. And then, you know, when we talked last time, you, you know, it's something clicked in me in, in my, in, in my nervous, in my neurologic brain. Um, and I love to study the, how the brain and the body are all connected. Yeah. And it's amazing. When you had that push-up position, you focused on that, that sensation, that, that those feelings, and then you allowed yourself to go through the motion. It's literally rewiring the brain yes. to, to regain that self-control, to regain yeah. that power, to re-empower yourself. And yes. you know, whether or not you can recall the origin of the emotion or not, that is one of the most key things I've ever heard. And I think what I, say that. Is, I think if you can have that awareness with that emotion, even if you're just noticing that you're having the feeling, whether or not you can define it fully, yes. going through the push-up, it literally brings the power back to you. I mean, yes. And I think you'd agree at this point, which is the first mantra that I have with emotional fitness for all of us. I mean, you can certainly apply it to the world of fitness. You can apply it to anything, but it was key for me to even start with the push up, which is accepting your path. I have so many clients that I meet at first and they're like, why am I overweight, Sean? Or why did I have to have an injury? Or why does this have to be? Why, why? And I was reading in your book and I found this story really fascinating. You're talking about going back to your old high school mm -hmm. and you're running. And you're going through, you know, if I could speak candidly about, you know, you're going through this relationship with this particular woman at the time, and should you be in this relationship or not, and you lost your keys. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for a lot of people, I thought that was a great story for a couple of reasons. Well, one, 
You would say, well, why me? I'm already going through this really tough time with this woman. And on top of it, I lost my keys. Like, really? Like, why me? Like, why me? And you could be angry and pissed and sad. And I was. <laughs> sure, totally. And nobody would doubt you for that. Nobody right. would, would fault you for that, obviously. But you took it as an opportunity to say to yourself, what is the universe presenting to me? Why is this happening? And so that's exactly how I felt. If I go back to 2004, you know, at this workshop, right? Hence me being challenged in front of my peers for the push-up. But the other part about it is, is that I wouldn't be able to do the journey on my own if I couldn't accept my path. Okay, have to accept the shot. These horrible things happen to me, but they don't have to be the end of my story. They certainly don't have to define me. Mm. They don't have to define me. And in fact, I can regain what you said, which is also one of my mantras, I can regain that power. I am very powerful. We forget that. We all, we all sort of, when things are going bad, it's very common. We all just want to be what? We all want to be victims. We're comfortable with it. As you said, I'm going to overeat. I'm already feeling lousy about my body. I'm pre-diabetic. I'm going to go for the ice cream again. But you chose to do something which was so empowering. You empowered yourself. Well, that, well, thank you. And that took work to get there. No, absolutely. And so what you're saying is when we assign ourselves the victim role, we subconsciously, meaning almost automatically, we do things, we make decisions, we make choices that, that feed that victim role. We do. And this is we something totally. learned uh, from my, uh, Dr. Alberto Velado. And essentially, mm. he talks about, you know, we're either the victim, the villain, or the hero. And when we recognize yeah. our story, we can shift our role. And so right. that's what that key, the key, um, the story about the keys that I lost in the book is essentially recognizing that life is, I have a belief that life is for us, working for us. And mm -hmm. so if I have that philosophy and I lost my keys, literally the key was something in my experience with this woman I was dating at the time, I had to wake up to a truth that I was ignoring, that I was stuffing away, and yeah. literally I lost the keys. And until, I mean literally, the moment I had the realization, I got a call from the school where I was running in the back was, yes. you know, was I grew up in, and yeah. they said, hey, someone turned in keys. Yes. I called a school a few days earlier saying, hey, of course. Been, yeah. And I love that part of the book, by the way. I love that. I love that part. Like, yeah. That was one of the most uh, amazing life-changing moments in my, uh, my life, really. Well, you know why I loved it? Because it was validation. <laughs> it was almost like the universe validating you. Yeah. That's really what it was. Yeah. 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 And, and, so, yeah. Go, ahead, go ahead, please. No, so, I, I mean, I, I guess the, the thing that I'm so excited about what you said was, and I don't mean a stereotype, I wish, I wish, honestly, more men would do this, which we can get to later in the conversation, but you talk about doing the work. You know, you, we talk about not being the victim. You talk about, okay, look, it takes work. And I think a lot of people don't know where to start, number one, and they don't want to because it's painful. It's painful stuff. And this is not easy stuff we're talking about. Let's be honest with each other. This is work. But it's the most rewarding work you will ever do. And for you to be emotionally free, and for me to be emotionally free in taking this journey and taking our own individual journeys, we really had given ourselves no choice because you couldn't go down the road you were going, and I don't could I. Mm -hmm. It was going to be destructive, you know, any way you shape it. So, you know, I'm not saying that we should necessarily drop confetti, but I guess, I guess what I'm saying is, is that we should be very proud of ourselves because we've done the work. We are, we are because of our hard work and that these are obtainable goals for a lot of people, but they have to certainly believe they can get there. And the reward really is emotional freedom. And to me, that's no greater reward. That's happiness. That's everything wrapped into one, whatever it is and you're searching for. That's it. That's it's, it. It's more than you think that it is. Right? And so it it? that's the that's the you know the pot of gold in my opinion it, it really is because when your emotions they can control your life everything and what we have to wake up to is that the emotions are the indicators just like the check engine light and so when yeah. something's out of whack there's something to be addressed and like oh, you yeah. said you know I, I think we should jump into it right now as as men it's yeah, let's do it. It's not, it's not the attitude that we're raised in. At least most of us are not raised in. Yes. You know, I, I grew up in a very much, you know, lift more weight, hit harder. Uh, don't, don't tell me if you're hurt, only if you're injured type atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I wasn't going to be the person that said I'm injured. So I right. just sucked it up. And that's been right. a lot of my life. And there's times when I was 26 that culminated to, either, to a huge decision point. You know, that's the, that was a fork in the road moment for me. And mm. so I, I'm very thankful that it chose the way I chose. 
Yeah. However, however, I do believe even if I chose a different route that, that, that time in my life, there is another choice point later on in life where I would have had another opportunity to make a positive decision for myself. I agree. And literally I'm the last, let's see, we're going to the last three months, even though I've done the work, I'm at another place where I, I, I've asked to go even deeper. Beautiful. And the challenge has come. I promise you. And it's been, it's been harder than the first one. And yep. less than two hours ago, I was at my doctor, my natural healer. And he's doing something to me that I, I do with other people. And I feel so free today. I, I, I literally am on top of the world today. And it feels so good that we made this call finally. And I don't, but everyone, everyone who's watching, this is probably what, our fourth or fifth attempt? To yeah, get yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's So it's, it's another synchronistic moment. And I see life that way. And yeah. life continues to show me that it's an accurate way of looking at life. Right. And that's kind of what the book's about. It's about letting you know that life is talking to you. Your body is talking to you. Yes. Your experiences are talking to you. We have to wake up and learn to read the language. Right. Yes. So just like with your push-up, you know, I, I want to ask you about, you know, that, that form, the first time you were in that push-up class. You know, yeah. from, from my recollection, you grew up in a very fitness-oriented family. Yes, yeah. And so, you know, when I heard your story the first time of that, that kind of surprised me. Yeah. But now yeah. hearing more of the story that you've been sharing over the last couple months, it makes yeah. sense. It makes sense. Yeah. You were basically blocked from areas of your life, therefore areas of your body, and oh, yeah. unaware. Oh, yeah. I had so much rage, so much repressed rage from, and I'm just going to be super transparent because that's where we're going today with yeah. You know, uh, sexual abuse as a child, um, to club feet. I mean, I had some, there was some real physical things that were there, um, you know, motor skills that I had to work on, but I had things that I just did not address like most young men do not. And unfortunately it was bottled and stored and repressed. Uh, and that was a challenge for me, but yes, I grew up in a, you know, grew up in a very, very healthy household. My dad was a professional bodybuilder. We had a really nice gym always growing up. I remember I first lifted, uh, my first bench press at 13 and I was laughing. I was, I mean, this is such a beautiful moment where my dad is spotted. He said, I mean, my dad is, you know, he's such a loving father, but he's so neurotic in the sense of he wants to make sure I'm okay. And I'm, you know, benching and I'm laughing my ass off because I was so happy I was moving. I was so happy I was getting that energy out of me. Mm. And it was such a beautiful, it was a beautiful memory of mine, mm. you know, and my dad was so worried I was going to hurt myself. He's like, Oh, you know, cost her on the way. Why are you laughing? But for me, it was freeing. It was finally, it was right. starting my, my physical journey for me personally. Um, but anyway, but so I've been really open about that recently in the, in the sense of wanting to help other men mm. wanting to, and of course, females as well about, you know, owning your truth. Mm -hmm. And I, the irony is that I see my mentor as well on Wednesday. So, uh, and we were talking and, you know, I, I had probably no exaggeration when I tell you this, maybe close to, I could have written just a book on this alone, probably 300 pages of journal entries, mm. um, all of last year. So from January 1st, December 31st, this is Very 2018, nice. obviously. And I remember my 40th birthday had come and I had all this repressed anger still last year around this time that was really manifesting as anxiety. And, I couldn't figure out what I was anxious about. Maybe I was really anxious about wanting all this work to be done with, but I couldn't really pinpoint it. And then I dove deeper with my mentor and we started talking about it. And she said, look, this is not, this is not anxiety, my friend. Mm -hmm. now, this is anger. You have still, you still, you are aware of the anger intellectually, but you're not in touch with it emotionally. You still need to get in touch with it emotionally. Mm -hmm. And it was hard for me personally because working out is so fun for me. I enjoy working out. Uh, but I had this sort of, I wanted to experience the anger physically. So, and doesn't necessarily mean yelling, doesn't mean screaming. It just means getting that emotion out of your body in a healthy way because anger can be very healthy. And I was told, you know, from different people growing up that anger is not a healthy tool and that we don't get angry. But I realized that that was wrong and that it's really important to feel anger. It's really important to embrace anger. That's so right. long story short, I celebrated my 41st birthday, uh, 41st birthday um, a couple weeks ago. And I felt much different this year than I did last year. And I was telling my mentor, you know, you mentioned about 
if you if you miss your opportunity to listen to your body, it's okay. There'll always be another opportunity. Right. And then you mentioned about going deeper, and that was me last year. Just when I thought I overcame something, there was another battle, or there was another dragon facing me, or you know, and I felt like you know some you know mythical creature like Achilles or something. Like oh, I got to fight another bad guy. But last year was a lot, a lot of hard work for me. There was a lot of emotional heavy lifting last year, in a great way, and I wouldn't change anything because. Now I'm starting to reap the benefits of this emotional freedom that I'm feeling. And I'm one with the anger and I don't feel anxiety at all. In fact, I'm, I've never been more present, but that's again because of the hard work that I did. So it was really nice to sort of celebrate myself a year later. Mm. And of course, this was many years in the making. It wasn't just doing the work for a year, but doing in this incredible intense work. So anyway, I guess what I say is, is that again, there is no better reward than actual, you know, going through the work and realizing, okay, if you overcome the first step, that's okay, because there's always going to be something else to work on. But you don't fear that you embrace that because you are becoming your best self. Exactly. And as men, and as men, we're talking about these, you know, incredibly personal, detailed stories that you're sharing, you know, incredible detailed, you know, stories about your health and I'm sharing about sexual abuse. These are things you know most men don't talk about. But we're freer just by talking about it. That's the first step. Or we're freer just by saying, you know what, Dr. Kevin, this is not anything to be ashamed of. Shame has no place. Guilt has no place. These are just useless emotions that do not serve us. No, we should be proud that these things happen to us because we're going to make ourselves better. We're going to make ourselves great. They will not define us. That's exactly right. I, mean, I look at emotions, and I didn't do this for a long time. The emotions are just like colors in a rainbow. And so yep. they're on the spectrum. So I don't want to throw it away. I need to honor it. I need to welcome it in. And it's my teacher. It has been my teacher and it continues to be. And, and yes. when, you know, it must be something about 40, I got to tell you. <laughs> and literally there is, there is some legitimacy to that. You know, yeah, on the, on the of the body, there's, there's times yeah. between 36 and 40 and then uh, 47 and 50 that we all go through yeah. these different transitions mm -hmm. physiology, uh, physiologically. And yeah. so, it also comes with a mental transformation. Yeah. And I look at it as if I, you know, the diamond analogy, the diamond only forms from coal through pressure. Right. If one other analogy, you can't get juice until you squeeze the fruit. So right. when right. I, when I have dedicated myself to be my best version to like you, to help serve people, to improve themselves. I think we both believe in the philosophy of the, of the rising tide that when the tide yeah. rises, all ships come up. So yes. I believe that when I do good things for myself and I do good things for others, it helps the entire planet. True. There's actually Agreed science to this, actually. It's called the hundredth oh. monkey study, a hundredth monkey effect. Nonetheless, this, this last couple months has been really challenging for me, and I don't believe I've fully uncovered what it's all related to, mm. yet the more I talk about it, the more I let people know in my circles, and the more I reach out to, and I'm very fortunate, because of my position in life, I have wonderful doctor friends and they have all kinds of interesting knowledge and I tap into those resources. And, and I, this is part of my mission I've, I'm discovering now is to share that essentially the body is holding on to some of these, these emotions. And I agree. we consciously may not be aware of that. I mean, just think of our body processes. Oh yeah. You know, we, everybody heard that we've only used 10% of our brain. Well, that's, our, that's our thinking mind. That's our conscious mind. The mm -hmm. rest is operating automatically. And yeah, we can have some influence when we breathe and things like that. Mm -hmm. So there's these te techniques that I'm learning right now for my own healing and, and things I've been sharing with people for the last five, 10 years that tap into that subconscious realm to help it release. And that yeah. comes out with crying. It comes out with anger. It comes out with laughter. And then yes. once it, once it runs its course, Sometimes a story I can remember, and sometimes it does, there's no need for the memory, so it just goes. And right. then, you know, so many interesting things happen that I've noted in my own self and my patients and experiences. The, literally, there's more motivation, there's more joy. You start looking at life in new ways, your perceptions improve. It's just, it's like life becomes beautiful again. Yeah. And I want this for everybody because, I, you know, like you said, it's, it's the happiest times in your life when you have these. You've done the work and, and now it, it comes around a few weeks, days, months, maybe even a year later, the benefits are there when you look back yeah. 41 to 40. And you've, I mean, you know, and, and to be, you know, to be transparent again, you know, we talk about 
you were suffering, you know, you're making choices because, you know, and I say that with respect to I was suffering, you know, you're when you're when you're in it, you know, you're suffering and it's painful. Right. And, you know, you do what you do and I do what I do because we want to help people not suffer. Right. We want to help people get there faster. And you're allowing such an honest place for them, like you said, to share their emotions because, you know, I thought it very fascinating. You know, if I'm feeling something in my neck or if I'm feeling something in my hip, like we talked about earlier in this conversation, you know, it's not just always physical. And I say the same thing to my clients when I meet a first client, you know, when I meet somebody for the first time or when I see somebody on the regular, how's your body feeling? What's going on? How's work? How's family life? Even though those are personal conversations to have, they are so crucial and critical. I can't just know about the body. Okay, you're feeling overactive here. You're feeling weak here. That's, that's so superficial, as you know. I got to go deeper. I, mm-hmm. It's so important to have that knowledge. And as you said, you know, when you're with somebody and whether they cry or whether they're happy or frustrated or angry or sad, whatever emotion they're feeling, I mean, you're always so, super honored to experience that. I know I am as well. But that's the release. That's the, the organic release that individual needs for whatever reason it's going on in their life. And it's super empowering. And I tell clients all the time, if they feel that way with me, I had certain clients that do that today, if not yesterday, if not this entire week, and they always want to apologize. And I say, there's nothing to apologize for. Absolutely not. That was an organic emotion that you just experienced. I want you to own that. I want you to stay with that because that's your power right there. Yeah. It really is. You know what, in, in, in my circles, we call that the innate intelligence, the wisdom within. And it's, constantly yeah. talking to us and when it has the opportunity because they feel safe with you because mm-hmm. they feel you know that v- there's that vulnerability and that vulnerability is is like an, a sweetness it's an openness it's a uh, it's it's the door that allows yeah. that flow to occur yes. and then when yes. that happens there's just beauty that comes every time even though it may not feel that way because it has right. to bubble up sometimes and as it as it bubbles up the stories come, the feelings come, yeah. and our interpretations come, and our perceptions come with that. Mm-hmm. But many of those are not based in truth. Right. And so that's what we're talking about earlier when we take on that victim role. It's not based right. in truth. Right. And I love what you just said, you know, because I'm, you know, for me in my emotional fitness practice, again, that first step is accepting your path, which I know is the hardest for most people. That's the literally, I think, uh, the, the five steps in my program, I think that is literally the hardest step. But what you just said, I think is super empowering that if you miss your moment, if you've missed your opportunity, it's okay. There's going to be another opportunity. Absolutely. The universe will keep sending you these signals or these teaching moments, which I think is so amazing because, you know, I don't want somebody listening or to hear this or to watch this and say, well, you know, that's it for me. I already missed it. No, you haven't missed it. And I say this to clients all the time where they're like, Sean, I haven't, you know, if I see somebody new for the first time, right? And this is a true story where this person wanted to, lose a certain amount of weight. They didn't reach their goal in the past. They're with me now to lose this weight. And of course I want to go over the emotional response. Why do you want to lose this weight? Mm. But I say to this person, even though you haven't lost it before, even though you weren't able to do this exercise before, I don't like that word always because that is a temporary word. It's a temporary word. It doesn't mean it's negative talk. It doesn't mean that it's not going to happen for you. You know, I think if we can get inside our heads and be kinder to ourselves, because I really want to talk about that. And I, I know you do that a lot. I know you work with your patients that it's being your best friend, being your biggest fan. You wouldn't treat, think about how you treat yourself. You know, I thought it was very interesting. Your book, you talked about, you had come home, you had a tough day and I found this very fascinating and you talked to, you know, your spouse at the time and you were, you said, you know, it probably wasn't the best talk, you know, probably was a little negative, you know, a little short. I wouldn't talk to a stranger that way. I believe that's how you quoted it. Right. Am I right? That's right. That's right. And yeah. And so, how do we be, how do we treat ourselves? Because I'd like to know your thoughts on this. How do we treat ourselves kinder? I mean, I know what I would say to my clients, but I'm curious on what you would say. How do you break that mold? Because, you know, you'll do anything for your friend. You'll do anything for your spouse, your child, right? We both have young daughters. We'll do anything for them. And the son, right? If I'm like, hey, man, lift this 500-pound weight, you'll do it for your daughter, man. You walk through walls, one-legged. You know, you'll do a pistol squat if you had to. <laughs> but maybe if it was yourself, not so much. So, right. How do you, how do you, how do you change that? How do you change that way of thinking? Well, there's a couple different ways though. One of the ones I like the most is first, you have to become aware. You have to become aware that you're having a thought in the first place. So many times we're even, we're not even paying attention to the, to the thoughts that are going in our mind and what they say like 70,000 thoughts a day on average. 
So there's so much talk going on. And Thank you. So I have to call it the monkey <laughs> mind exercise. And literally, you. you just write down a couple of the, the major thoughts that are happening that you okay. that are the negative self talk. And once you once you find out what some of those those major ones are, you write them down. And I re I rework the phrase. So yeah. I used to say that was stupid of me, stupid of me. I used to say it all yeah. the time to myself. And so once yeah. I figured that out, I then I reworked it to say I could be smarter about that. Mm. That became my affirmation. I love that. Now affirmations are one of the best ways to get past that conscious mind into the subconscious mind. Mm -hmm. So we want to start saying that repeatedly. Yes. Now there's another wrinkle to that. It's called affirmations. So we want to also ask, why am I smarter? So if we ask our brain a question, our brain has an ability, it has to answer it. So if we ask ourselves, well, why are we so stupid? Or how could we be more smart? Well, the brain is going to come up with an answer. So what the quality of your question you're asking yourself is going to really dictate the quality of the answer you're going to get, and therefore the feelings and emotions that come with that. Right. Now, if you know that you're asking good questions and, you, and, and yet you're still getting negative responses, there's something that has to be worked on. Something mm. that has to be helped. So yes, I like talk therapists. I like all kinds of different therapists there. Mm -hmm. But there's, some, there's lots of self-healing techniques. There's something called emotional freedom technique where you mm -hmm. tap different spots on your body that are related to the acupuncture system. Mm -hmm. There's something called the Sedona method. And you ask yourself different questions, these why questions, these yeah. could you questions, these yeah. is it possible type questions. And yeah. it's, it's as if, just like we talked about earlier with welcoming it in, it is it almost releases the intensity of the experience and you feel more peaceful. Sure. So all these take repetition, just like push-ups. So you get better and better and better. So yeah. step number one is awareness, waking up, saying, yes, okay. I, I know I can be better. Yes, I want to be better mm -hmm. and I deserve to be better. That's right. Thanks. So, you know, you use the word deserve, which is another one of my steps, one of my mantras about mm -hmm. that you are worthy. That's and, right. You know, I, I, I drive that into my clients, obviously, in a very peaceful, kind way. That was a lot of my journey, a lot of what I had to work on. Because, you know, when bad things happen to us, we just sort of believe that that's what we were meant to have, that we were meant that's to right. experience that. So if somebody, if somebody abuses you or hurts you, especially as a young child, you start thinking, well, you know what? That was my fault. Or I meant that, that was supposed to happen to me or I deserve that. And, you know, you couple that with how the world can be. Obviously, you know, there are a lot of cruel people out there. There's, there's a lot of wonderful people out there too. But I guess you, you start um, changing that cognitive behavior, what you, what you were alluding to earlier, and you start telling yourself, you know what, I am stupid, or I am this, I am that, all this negative self-talk, as my, this one particular client used the word always. Mm. And it's sad. It's really, really sad because we, you know, we, we self-loathe, we're... You know, I think with social media being what it is, it's such a wonderful tool, but I think for a lot of people, it's, especially with young kids, and I, I do see a few teenagers where it's, you know, I didn't have it when I was a teenager, obviously, and I know you didn't either, clearly, but it doesn't really serve them all so well, where you start looking at someone's life, and you start thinking they have no problems, and you start comparing, and you, you know, you create this awful mirror effect, and it's, it's really, de it's a detriment. So... I completely agree with you. I think these are all wonderful tools. I'm a huge fan of therapy, you know, cognitive behavior therapy, of course, yeah, yeah. journaling, meditation, obviously right. the physical part, all that. Uh, but I think it's not a one size fits all, which you mentioned. And so I think it's whatever serves somebody in a healthy way. But, you know, changing that vernacular where for me personally, it was, I am worthy or I am, you know, you, you see all these taglines that people use, you know, I can't remember the exact commercials, but you know, you're worth it or whatever it is which is silly, but also the message, you know, whether you want to, you know, whether this consumer wants you to buy the product or not, at least it's a bit positive, the sense of, you know, you are worth it. You know, there's no price on self care. That's just it. There's no, you're not, you mentioned this in your book and I love this because it's not selfish to have self care in your life. It's not selfish, especially if you're a parent like we are, you know, it's not selfish to go to the gym. It's not selfish to get a massage. It's not selfish to go to the chiropractor. It's not selfish to see a personal trainer. These things are not selfish. These That's things right. are a necessity. That's right. You will not heal yourself if you do not take care of yourself. That's right. Um, the, and so, I love your, so we just share the same mind on so many levels, but yeah. that was another huge takeaway for me. Yeah. I absolutely well, I mean, love that. And, you know, and we all can get there real easily. It's just the, if you've ever been in an airplane or seen a movie in there about something in an airplane, it's the oxygen mask analogy. This oh, yeah, totally. About. Right. And I wanted to step back to a, a, something you said a moment ago 
when we talk about deserving and worth and value, mm -hmm. it's really this, this, and it's, you know, our daughters are at this age. They're asking, they're starting to ask why, starting to ask yes. why a lot. And so yes. here we are, we're hurt children. We, you know, people around us are trying to do the best they can. And some people, they've been hurt themselves. So they're just unknowingly playing out the role. And right. we ask this question of why is it happening? And then we have, to, our brain has to come up with a story. So of course you become a victim. Of course you're stupid. Of course this, that, and the other thing. And, right. and so this is where we get to use our educated mind. It's where we get to use and ask a new question. Mm -hmm. And then we can get better answers and then start to heal that child self, start to heal where we are now and start to see the beauty in life. Yes. Thank you for bringing that up, Sean. And the child self, by the way, thank you for bringing this up. The child self, that subconscious mind, right? Because let's be honest, you know, your child is so important. It's where, you know, you, you start forming all these ideas of, you know, they say your personality is set between the ages of three and five. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you start... You know, you, you look at your parents as these teachers, you idolize your parents, whether they're right or wrong. Right. Uh, but you start creating all these foundations, in other words. Mm -hmm. And a lot of stuff gets pushed down. A lot of this stuff gets pushed down that we don't even realize. Right. And, I mean, you know, clearly if you don't do the work, and then you mentioned earlier in this conversation about people being not aware. So, okay, let's see. Let's say unfortunate things happen to you as a child. You start to age. You become a teenager. The life choices that you make, you may be making those subconsciously, not even realize you're even making them right. because you know you don't. You're not aware of the things that happened to you as a child, and so to me, that's so sad. I mean, to me, that's and and, and in, in certain ways, I mean, you certainly saved yourself, as did I, but certain people aren't so lucky, you know. And so that's so unfortunate, you know, when I hear stories like that. So I guess what I'm saying is, it's so important to kind of. Do your best to go back and obviously your experience as a child might be different than someone else's experience when you were a child, but your experience is really real to you. Your reality is real to you and it's true right. to you. That's right. And you have to honor that. And I know that you do. And I think that's a beautiful thing because a lot of people don't honor their past. And therefore, if you can't honor your past, it's going to follow you. These lessons in life, I truly believe, keep coming up. The universe has a very incredible way of presenting itself with the same lesson to learn over and over and over again until you do. Well, we just, you know, there's some basic needs we all have in common. You know, we all, we all need love. We all need food. We all need oxygen. We all need water. And at the end of the day, we all just want to feel good. Yeah. And so these decisions as teenagers, as young adults, even as, even as 40 year olds. Oh yeah. And even, you know, I even see, I think of my grandparents sometimes it's like, we just want to feel good. We want to have laughter. We want to have fun. And so yeah. we go about it in any way we can to have mm -hmm. that experience. So yeah, I used to drown myself in alcohol and, and that was fun for a time, but then boy, it wasn't, and I couldn't turn it off. And so where was that's, that's part of why the, the obesity came and, but other people they are into drugs. Other people they are into all kinds of, you know, daredevil stuff. And, and sure. look, that's fun too. I like, I like bungee jumping. I like all that fun stuff. Yeah, but at some yeah. point, the risk behavior becomes a problem and it not, not only puts yourself, it can hurt others. And right. then that's a real issue. And so at the end of the day though, it's all about feeling good. Agreed. So when we, like we've been talking about the whole time now. So it's about accepting number one, step one, awareness, accepting. Mm -hmm. This is where we're at. And if anyone's out there and needs assistance, a, a, a contact. I know Sean is open. I know I'm open. There's so many people out there that are willing to assist you in, in the journey. Yes. Though it's you that has to do the work. You got to say, yes, I am. I'm ready. Yes. You, don't and know, what's entailing. you know that you're right. ready to take that step. Right. Because you can't help somebody that doesn't want to help themselves. That's right. Yeah. That person has to want to get help. And, you know, specifically to the male audience, mm. if you have a problem, if, you, if that is not weakness, vulnerability is a strength. I want to say that again. Vulnerability is an absolute strength. You don't have to suffer in silence. You're not any less of a man if you're going through something that you don't know even what it's about. That's or right. if you're struggling for any particular reason, that's okay. It's absolutely okay. You're going to become a better version of yourself just by talking about it. There's no crime in talking about it. If anything, I think it makes you more of a man that we can open up to these things because you're brave enough to address mm -hmm. yourself versus just right. put it away into some bottle or some pill or whatever that may be. That's right. hundred percent. Yeah. Right on, Sean. Well, I think that was a great conversation. Uh, this is, we went very quickly, almost yeah. an hour long here. And, we covered uh, it all. 
we're gonna have to do it again because I know we got oh, more yeah. material. There's always more material coming sure. up. Yeah. Um, so Kevin, how can people reach you? Well, my website, drkevang.com, is okay. the easiest way. Uh, okay. I wrote the book, uh, Decode Your Pain. Hopefully, it's coming out straight, right. and that's me on the cover. I'm giving yes, it away sir. for free, cover to shipping. I want people to get this that's material. Incredibly generous. And I have to tell everybody, it is an incredible read. It's a fast read, and I couldn't put it down. I mean, I'm going to be, I mean, I, literally. And not only do we share so many of the same philosophies, I thought, you know, the personal stories, again, you know, you running, you know, in your old high school, um, wedding, you know, knowing when to say goodbye to a relationship that doesn't serve you anymore. I, I think a lot of people just need to read the book for that. Uh, and then your own personal journey, again, how I asked you in the beginning of this conversation, you know, making steps in your 20s to obviously be your best self in your 40s. So it's incredible read. Incredible read. Well, I want to say and that you're giving it for free is super generous. Well, thank you. Thank you. And, you know, I, I, it's, a, it's a calling of mine. It, has, it had to come out. I had to express. Mm -hmm. Just like anything that's been built up, repressed, what it suppressed, it has to come out. So it's going to come out one way or the other. And this oh, yeah. is a gift that I've been given because I've leaned on others when mm -hmm. I needed that. And okay. this is really the reason I'm here is because of other people, because I knew something that I, I owned that I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to do it. And that was totally okay. I, it didn't feel okay at first, but it's definitely okay now. And more than okay. And now Sean, for my audience, you know, yes. tell, tell them more about push up aggression. So push up aggression. It's in its second volume. You can get it on, zetlinfitness.com i'll spell my last name z-e-t-l-i-n fitness.com it's an amazon at barnes and noble uh, it's a 24 push-up journey so if you're a beginner no worries you you come as you are you don't have to be this advanced person clearly you know i was not when i started the push-up so there is an absolute section if you're a beginner uh, if you're an athlete if you're someone who's 90 years old and wants to just work on bone density uh it's there for you as well. So it's really a one size fits all, which I'm super proud of. And you can certainly go at your own pace and there's multiple programs in there for wherever you are currently. Uh, I talk a bit about posture, of course, the emotional journey, and most importantly, believing that you can do an exercise, not thinking you can do it, believe that you can do it because you're worthy enough to do it. That's you really exactly, are. That's exactly right. Well, Sean, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, man. This was super fun. I can't wait for the next one. That's right. That's right. All right. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Dr. Kevin.